Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome into part two of the second part of the third installment. And uh, I want to say something as we progress in this talk and the next one until I finish with this main talk about if the Quran is enough, how did we learn how to pray? We shall see that Al Isra and Al Mi'raj as an event wasn't that important at all. All in the early days of Islam when the messenger was alive in Mecca and even after that. Allah didn't pay any importance to these journeys as they say, not even mention the name of the messenger nor said that the messenger was taken through the heavens all the way to the seventh heaven uh, as for going to Jerusalem that was also totally alienated. Allah didn't even refer to him. So why then are is or is Al-Misra Al-Isra and Al-Mi'raj these journeys, why are they so important these days? Why? Has the messenger really, I don't, I really see, we need to ask this why. Because in the early days, again, books of history and hadith report that some people didn't really understand much what took place at that time. Here is an example of such a thing. One day a man went to our mother Aisha and asked her, has Muhammad seen his God? She answered, the hair of my body has risen because of what we have said. Then she recited to him, La tudrikul absar, no visions can reach him about Allah. And this is in Surah 6, Ayah 103. And this hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim and others. This statement also is linked to Abdullah ibn Abbas. And uh, as Muslim himself reports this in his book of Hadith, he even have a section of in his book where he says that the meaning of the saying of Allah, and he has seen him another time in the Surah 53, Ayah 13. Then Muslim, the great Imam, you know, you've got Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawud, so we're talking about that Muslim. He asked a question, did the Prophet see Allah? In the night of Al-Isra, it is incredible that they even think about asking this question. And then he brings in the statement of Abdullah ibn Abbas. Listen to this. They say, in the translation of the ayah, that the mind belied not what he saw. And certainly he saw him in another descent. And the Muslim says, this implies, of course he says this because Abdullah ibn Abbas said it, this implies that Allah, that Muhammad saw Allah twice, but he saw him with his heart. How can you see somebody with your heart? Really strange. How can you see somebody with your heart? Ibn al-Qayyim, the student of Ibn Taymiyyah, reported the disputes between the scholars about the Allah's vision. Did the messenger see the Allah eye to eye, i.e. with his eyes looking at Allah? And then he mentioned that Ibn Taymiyyah, his teacher, said about this matter. He said, see, this is Ibn Taymiyyah, seeing Allah with the eyes has not been established, i.e. that the messenger saw Allah with his eyes, this hasn't been established in any way. And none of the companions ever said that. And what Ibn Abbas said, that he saw Allah and he saw him with his heart, none of the two contradicts each other. Ajib, strange. He didn't see Allah, but he sees it, he saw it with his heart. And Mr. Ibn Taymiyyah says, these two do not contradict each other. I haven't seen Allah, I saw him with my heart. I don't know how to, uh, I'm sure you're as confused as I am, but anyhow. But what they say, Ibn Qayyim al jawziyah says, what Ibn Taymiyyah means is, it is, and this is extremely dangerous, and I want you to pay attention, really. It is possible to see Allah in dreams, and because in dreams, even though we see things, but their vision is not done with the eyes, but rather with the mind. 
So basically what Ibn Taymiyyah says is that just like in a dream, if, if in a dream you, 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 you dream like a dog is running behind you and it want to bite you, you're scared and you feel you're running and things like that, you saw that. But in reality you didn't see it, but you saw it in your mind. So what they're saying is the messenger of Allah didn't see Allah with his eyes, but just like you saw the dog running after you in your dream, him, he saw Allah. Allah, this is a lie. The fact that this issue was even discussed between scholars shows beyond belief that our so-called scholars had and still have no clue of what Allah says in the Quran. They read the Quran, but it never goes beyond their tongues. Because Allah says in the Quran, لا تدركه الأبصار No visions can reach him. When Allah says no vision, it's no vision in the dream, no vision uh, when you are awake, no vision when you are in the deep of the ocean, no vision when you are cooking, no vision, no vision, no vision. How come they don't, they, they, they don't get that? It's incredible. Because the possibility of a human seeing Allah should never ever have been mentioned, much less disputed. Seeing Allah is never a possibility. But when you hear our scholars saying that seeing Allah in our dreams is possible, then you really must worry and get and be concerned and alert. My dear sisters and my brothers, I'm going to pass on now and discuss the hadiths about these celestial journeys, Al-Isra and Al-Mi'raj. Because there are so many hadiths that have been reported about these. And of course, Mr. Anas ibn Malki reported only one. And he said it may be one, but after that, once you see, once you put the news on the internet, you, are, you no longer own it. It becomes the property of everybody. And then you have the Chinese whispers. Each one adds a little bit until it goes out of control. And if there are two topics where people have lied through their teeth in them, one of them is Al-Isra and Al-Mi'raj. The messenger saw this in hellfire, and he saw that, and he saw this, and he saw that, and he saw women, and he saw women in hellfire, and he even saw women who are hung by hooks from their breasts. Why? Because they didn't feed the kids. <laughs> Good God, ya Allah. So let's see what this hadith of Anas says. So we're going to start with Qatada. Qatada is one of the people they say who got from Anas from somebody else. We don't care about who heard it from there because the end of it, it all goes back to Anas ibn Malik. The hadith goes a little bit longer. So I'm just going to start from then a white animal was, uh, which was smaller than a mule and bigger than a donkey was brought to me. So this is the Prophet Muhammad speaking. And on this, Al Jarud, one of the people who is reporting the hadith, said, he's a follower, okay? He says, Was it Al Buraq, Ya Abu Hamza? Abu Hamza is the nickname of Anas. So he says, Was it Al Buraq? Al Buraq in the uh, Muslim uh, theology is that is, is an animal that has wings and is white and is uh, again uh, smaller than mule, bigger than a donkey, and flies. So that's what it is. And Anas answered, Yes, it is. And then the Prophet carried on saying, The animal's speed was as such that it would step on the farthest point its eyesight reaches. So you have the horse, it looks a mountain there. By the time it sees the mountain, it steps on it. And then, so this is an animal with huge, gigantic legs or a flying uh, animal. This is almost like a, a tennis ball jumping. So it jumps from here to there, to there, to there, to there. And then the messenger says, of course, as they say, I was carried on it. Then Jibreel led me till we reached the first and nearest heaven. Now we're going to start with the ascension to the first heaven. Jibreel sought permission to be admitted and was asked by the guardians of the first heaven, Who is this? And Jibreel answered, Jibreel. It was asked, Who is with you? Now the, you see, when someone lies, <laughs> it is strange. Jibril comes there, this, it looks like these angels do not know who Jibril is, because they ask who is this, and he goes, Jibril, oh, it's you. 
How did they know there was somebody with him since they can't see who Jibril was and who was with him? I accept, Jibril knocks on the door, okay, the angels do not see who is beyond the gate, who is there, Jibril, oh, come in, and once they open the gate, oh, you're not alone, who is this, oh, it's my, it didn't happen like that, Jibril knocks on the gate, <laughs> who is there, Jibril, and who is with you? Now, if they could see who's the second person with him, wow, but in hell, let's carry on, otherwise we'll spend the night here. He replied, Muhammad, the guardians asked, had he been summoned? Uh, he called up to come here, Jibril said, yes, it is incredible, he is with Jibril, they should have just let him pass on, right? But anyhow, the guardians said, may he be welcomed, and what a pleasant visitor he is. The access was granted, and uh, the messenger says, and when I entered the first heaven, I saw Adam in there. Jibril addressed me saying, this is your father Adam, go say a salab to him. So I greeted him and he returned the greeting to me and said, so this is Adam talking, be welcomed my good son and pious prophet. So here Adam knows who Muhammad is. He is one of his sons, okay, that I can buy. How did he know he was a prophet? But anyhow. The story goes on. They now fly to the second heaven. The same story happened. Jibril knocks on the door. Who is this? Jibril, who is with you? Muhammad, has he been summoned? Yes, come and die, die. The guardian said, may he be welcomed. Then, you know, the access is granted. And in the second heaven, guess what? The messenger sees Yahya and Jesus, both of them alive. And of course, Yahya and Jesus and Isa are maternal cousins. They are from the same family. Jibril addressed, me, addressed the messenger, told him, told him, that is Yahya and that is Isa. Go say salam to both. So I greeted them both. And they responded to him. They responded to salam. And then they told him, be welcomed, our good brother and pious prophet. It seems the messengership of the prophet Muhammad is news. Everybody knows about it even though these people are dead, but, but anyhow, let's go to the third heaven, the same scenario goes on him, da, 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 until he goes, and then on the third heaven he sees Yusuf, Joseph, and the same thing, you, he, uh, Jibril tells him, go say salam alaikum to Yusuf, and I go and I say to that, and Yusuf responds back, and then he tells him, be welcomed, my good brother and pious prophet, and then they ascend to the fourth heaven. Only Allah knows how many, the distance between heaven and heaven, but it looks like everything is super fast. And I'll get back to this in a little bit. On the fourth heaven, the same thing. Knock on the door, who is this? Jibril, who is with you? The same thing. And once they enter, the Prophet says, I saw Idris, Enoch. And Jibril tells him, that's Idris. Go say salam alaikum to him. And of course he goes, Salam alaikum, how are you? And Idris tells him, be welcomed my good brother and pious prophet. They proceed to the, first, uh, to the fifth heaven. Same story again. Who is this? Muhammad, Jibril, da, da. They enter the fifth heaven and guess what? There the prophet says, I saw Harun, Aaron, who is the brother of Musa. And of course, he tells him, go say salam alaikum to him. He goes and Harun answers back, be welcomed my good brother and pious prophet. Let's go to the sixth heaven. Same thing, Jibril ascends with me till we reach the sixth heaven. Who is this? Jibril, who is with you? Muhammad, has he been summoned? Yeah, he's been called up. Come on, get in. Welcome, be pleasant. MashaAllah, you're a good man. Then in the sixth heaven, he saw Moses, Musa. And Jibril tells him, go say salam alaikum to Musa. Keep this information. Musa in the sixth heaven. And of course, Musa tells him, be welcomed, my good brother and pious prophet. Of course, there are, uh, 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 there are other versions of this, and I'll read it after I finish from here, from this one. After I left Musa, Musa wept. Musa, a dead person, finished. He cried. And then someone asked Musa, I don't know who that someone, an angel, I don't know who asked Musa. 
But the prophet, the prophet had left. Musa wept, so he wept behind the prophet. Someone asked Musa, how did the prophet know the, who told who? But anyhow. You see, once somebody lies, it's so easy to add other lies. So also Musa answers, oh, I, weigh, I weep because a young boy has been sent after me whose followers will enter paradise in greater numbers than my followers. <laughs> I love him. Okay, in greater number. So Musa is jealous, dead jealous. Musa, Musa. Musa Kalimullah, Musa is the man who spoke to a God on earth. He's the only one to have done that. He's jealous, but you know. To the seventh heaven, same thing they ascend to the seventh heaven. Who is this, Jibril? Who is with you? Muhammad, has he been called up? Has he been summoned? Yes, come in. Oh, you are welcome. How pleasant you are. And then the access was granted to the seventh heaven. When he walks in, he sees Ibrahim, Abraham. And Ibril, uh, Ibril, Jibril, addressing the Prophet Muhammad, tells him, that's your father, Ibrahim. Go say salam alaikum to him. So the messenger gets there and he greets him. And now Ibrahim answers back, be welcomed, my good brother and pious prophet. Then, and this is now the, when it gets really cringy, he says, I was ascended. So the messenger was ascended to Sidratul Muntaha. Sidratul Muntaha on earth here, we have a tree called the Lot tree, L-O-T-E, or the Lot tree, as you, depending on who says it, tree, okay? And they translate Sidratul Muntaha to the Lot tree of the final boundary. And this is a Mediterranean tree with very, very thorny bushes. And to get to its fruits, you will suffer thousand and one uh, thorns on your hand. But the messenger goes on describing this thorny bush to us, and he goes, its, its fruits were like big jars. And these jars are found in Hajar. And this is a place near Al Medina. And then he says, and its leaves were as big as the ears of elephants. Mind you, the messenger of Allah never saw an elephant. How could he describe something to something he doesn't know? I don't know, but anyhow. Jibril said, this is Sidratul Muntaha. This is the lot or the lot tree of the final boundary. I, just because Allah mentioned it in the Quran, they have said that that tree is ever be, after that tree is Allah. That's it. It's like uh, draw a line and you see this is the final boundary. And then put a snake after that line and you go anyone who crosses that final boundary would get uh, beaten by its snake. So uh, basically that's what they say. The lot tree or the lot tree is the final boundary. Then the messenger added, he goes, there were four rivers, two hidden and two visible. Now, if these were hidden, how did he see they were two? Yeah, I understand he saw the visible ones, but how about the hidden one? How did he see them? But anyhow, I asked Jibril, what are these here, Jibril? Jibril replies, the hidden rivers are inside paradise, are inside Jannah. Okay, even though Allah speaks about thousands upon thousands of rivers in paradise, but, uh, but what can we say? And the two visible ones that you see are the Nile and the Euphrates. For your information, the Nile is the one that you hear in Egypt. It's about 6,650 kilometers, about 4,130 miles. And it starts from the depth of Africa and travels all the way to Alexandria and meets the Mediterranean Sea there. The Euphrates or al Forat is a long river in Iraq and it goes into the western of Asia. And it starts from the Middle East and Iraq and goes all the way to the Middle Asia. And this is a big also river. And in the Muslim belief today, the Nile of Egypt and the Euphrates or al Forat of al Iraq are rivers from paradise. Allah al it's, 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 it's incredible how much, what they have made of Allah's religion. But anyhow, you know, let's carry on. All right. And then the hadith goes on. Then Al-Bayt Al-Ma'mur. 
And Beit al-Ma'mur is translated as the often frequently and filled a house, which they say is in the seventh heaven. Hadiths are that each day 70,000 angels enter it, and they will go again and take turn to going back to it, and they will never ever get an opportunity. And they will tell you that's because of the great number of angels. So it's an indefinite number of angels. The hadith here, this hadith here in Bukhari and Muslim says that this al-bayt al-ma'mur, the frequently filled house, which is in the seventh heaven, was lifted up and shown to me. A little bit more on this later on, inshallah. Then, a, then Jibril presents the messenger with a container of wine and another of milk. This is on the seventh heaven. They have wine. <laughs> they have wine there. And they have milk there. And they have honey there. So Jibril brings a tray with wine, milk, and honey to the Prophet. And he brings it forth and he says, pick one. And then the Messenger of Allah picks up milk. And Jibril comments on this act saying, this is the fitrah, meaning this is the tawheed of Allah you've taken, which you and your followers are upon. What a lie. What's this? Taking somebody to the seventh heaven, present him with wine and honey and milk. What if somebody is lactose intolerant and takes honey? What if I was in seventh heaven and I go, you know what? I'm in seventh heaven. I might as well have a sip of the wine curiosity just to see what it tastes like. And then Jibril is going to tell me, you, you thought you've blown it, man. You're going to go to hellfire. But the, a lie is a lie. There is no wine up there. There is no milk up there. There is no honey up there. There is no trees up there. And there certainly is no house up there. But in how let's carry on. Because uh, I'll, I'll carry on. I will come back to this point later on, inshallah, because the talk is a little bit longer. The Salat obligation. So the messenger gets to the seventh heaven. Guess what? At which point here, they say that the messenger of Allah was walking with Jibreel. And at one point, Rasulullah walked inside, kind of like a tunnel. And he turns back and sees Jibreel had stopped, he couldn't, and, and he saw him there as an angel. But that angel, it almost was as old as your oldest quilt. It's a piece of garment. It's really, it's been... And the messenger of Allah tells Jibreel, come with me. Jibreel tells him, no, I cannot come with you because if I step one more step, I'll be burned alive. You go by yourself. A human being, a human being. Jibreel, the mighty spirit that he is, the favorite spirit of Allah, cannot step Muhammad, a human being, steps and walks in. Where is he going to meet up with Allah? Astaghfirullah al-Haqq. Astaghfirullah al-Haqq. Astaghfirullah al-Haqq. Wa ma qadarullah haqqa qadri. And they have not respected Allah as he ought to. They haven't given him his due respect as he deserves it. But anyhow. The Salat was given, Allah orders, there is a discussion, guys, I don't want to get into it at this moment, I will surely discuss it later on. Allah gives 50 Salat per day to the Messenger. End of conversation, Muhammad now is making his way back to earth. Remember, I told you, remember where Musa was? It was on the sixth heaven. On my way back, this is Muhammad speaking, I passed by Musa, who asked, what were you ordered to do? My question would be to uh, Musa, how did you know that something was ordered to me to do? How did you know that? And uh, why do you ask him, Musa? What's your business in this? And is Musa free to do as he pleases in the second and the sixth heaven? Why Ibrahim didn't interfere? Or didn't he know? Or did he know and he didn't care? What's your problem, Musa? But anyhow, I replied, I was ordered 50 Salat per day. Musa said to him, your followers cannot bear 50 Salat per day. And by Allah, I have managed people before you and unsuccessfully supervised the children of Israel. 
Go back to your Lord and ask Him to ease those 50 salat for your nation. And I, Abdul Salam, say, this is an incredible accusation against Allah. Musa knows the future. Musa knows how we Muslims will be or will do with these prayers. Allah didn't have a clue. He gave us 50 and he thought, oh, 50 is a good number. Yeah, they, they'll be able to do it. Musa goes, no, they won't be able to do it. Musa knows what the believers can bear and cannot, while Allah doesn't know. Musa has more compassion on us than Allah himself. Musa knows more about us than Allah himself. Go back to your Lord and ask him for reduction. Hasn't Allah said in Al-Quran, Doesn't he who created us knows of his own creation? Of course he does. And he is the ever subtle, the all aware. Doesn't Allah say, And he is the all knower of everything? Doesn't Allah say this? What's this? What This kind of ayat in the Quran where Allah says, I encompass everything, nothing goes away from my watch, nothing, all this I know, things like that. All these ayat we might as well recycle them. They have no usage. Why? Because Allah says, You perform 50 salat. Mr. Musa says, We cannot. Muhammad, who does he listen to? To Allah who said 50 or to Musa? You know the answer. Even though Allah says in the Quran, and no, talking to us and anyone, of course, He said this to, to the Jews, to Christians, and everyone, that Allah is aware of all things. Allah's infinite knowledge about human creation, my dear sisters and my brothers, gives Him all kinds of powers and all kinds of abilities to know what we are and what we aren't capable of. And he knows what we can and cannot do. Allah's infinite knowledge about us makes him to never ever put us through something we aren't capable of doing. Allah doesn't ask us to go live in the oceans because he knows we cannot. He has not equipped us with that. So when Allah ordered us those 50 daily salats and a human being calling him on that, correcting him on that and he just ordered that's it go back to your lord and ask him muhammad does not listen to and he doesn't say to musa who are you to say this to allah right but who is the boss here it's musa who is the boss it's muhammad and the second boss allah reduce the numbers Wallahi al-Azim, it's incredible. So the ayah where Allah says, La yukallifu Allahu nafsan illa wusaha. Allah will not order, order a soul, i.e. a human being, to do more than what it can do. But that goes out of the window. 50 salats. So Allah didn't know until Musa brought him back into reality. My dear sisters, the part of Musa asking reduction of a salat for us makes Musa more compassionate, more loving towards us than Allah himself. And this is incredible. This is a horrible and a catastrophic part that makes Allah seem the cruel, the cruelest God ever that doesn't know what is good or bad for those who believe and love him. Those who want to worship him. A God who wants us to spend the whole day doing nothing, just salat after salat. After Salat, after Salat, 50 Salat in 24 uh, hours a day, that's two Salat, almost two Salat, and a little bit extra. If you remove the eight hours, we'll end up almost four Salat in every hour. How are we going to live? It doesn't Allah say, Inna Allah bin nasi la rahim. Certainly Allah with people is very compassionate and very merciful. But according to the story of Al-Isra and Al-Mi'raj, it is Musa. How can a believer even begin to comprehend this? Force Allah to bring the number from 50 all the way down to 5? One of the most demanded beliefs on us is to believe that Allah had planned all 
whatever is going to happen ahead of time. And they tell you this is the eternal knowledge, al-ilmul azali, that Allah had planned everything. And based on this huge lie, it's huge lie. Allah has not planned everything ahead of time. But we are led to believe that our faith is sealed. That Allah had written everything. And I will mention this in the next hadith. That, that say Allah had done everything and it's all gonna run based on how Allah sees things. And this makes Allah the horriblest God. Because what's, why should Fir'aun be put in hellfire for eternity when it is Allah who has written what Fir'aun should do? But what they tell you, oh, Allah knew that Fir'aun would be a bad person, so he gave him that. No, I'm sorry. On judgment day, uh, Fir'aun would have said, Ya Allah, had you given me a fair ground, not judged me ahead of time, I would have performed better. Allah is going to say, I knew you would, and uh, Fir'aun is going to say, sorry, that's your knowledge, and I'm very respectful of that, but I don't accept it as an evidence. Why? Because if you gave me free choice, I would have chosen other things. It is either Allah has truly planned this and then acted like he didn't know and wrote that Musa would correct him and that Allah would stand corrected and would reduce the number each time Muhammad asks for or B, Allah didn't write any of this and that he miscalculated the number and stood corrected by Musa. It's either this or that. It's either he planned it ahead of time or he didn't plan ahead of time. In both situations, Allah is wrong. And this cannot be true, cannot be right. It's impossible. Oh, what can we say, my this is uh, my brothers? But anyhow, but in the man-made Islam, it doesn't matter if the Qur'an is ignored. It doesn't matter if Allah contradicts himself. It really doesn't matter what Allah says in the Qur'an. Who cares? The, he says something in the Qur'an and contradicts it in the Hadith. No big deal. All that matters is those men made up Hadiths. These men made up Sunnahs. These men made up things that have been written 300 years after the death of the Prophet Muhammad cannot go wrong. Anything else can go to hellfire except what the men have made up. But anyway, let's carry on with this blasphemous hadith. The messenger goes, so I went back and Allah reduced 10 for me. Then again, one more time, coming down, Musa tells him, your followers will not be able to follow. Go back to your God, ask him reduction. So Muhammad goes another time, it's 30, and another time it's 10, and another time, uh, sorry, 20, another time it's 10. And then the same thing, Musa tells him, your people cannot do it, go and ask for reduction. So the Prophet Muhammad goes back to Allah, I don't know what Rasulullah tells him. Yeah, Allah, Musa told me, or is he going to say, yeah, Allah, my people cannot bear. Because if he tells him, yeah, Allah, Musa told me, so he's telling him that, yeah, Allah, Musa is telling him, you've taken a wrong decision. And if he taking control of that and owns it and says, Ya Allah, my people cannot, then he's telling Allah that you didn't know what you did. My people cannot and he gave me more. And both statements are also disbelief. But the sheikhs, they don't think like this. Their brains are washed. It's incredible. But anyhow, so he goes back again with five. Musa asks him, what have you been ordered? I replied, I being the messenger, I have been ordered to observe five prayers a day. Musa goes on the same scene. Your followers cannot bear the five daily prayers. Go back to Allah and ask him for this and this. And then I, the messenger, said, I have requested so much of my Lord that I feel ashamed. I even reluctant and timid. But I am satisfied now and surrender to Allah's order. Surrender to Allah's order, ya Muhammad. Does, that, does this mean that in those times when you went back to Allah and you asked for reduction, you have not surrendered? You rebelled and you refused? Is this what it is all about? You didn't surrender except at the end of it? Now comes my dear sisters and my brothers, the most cringing part in the whole thing. When the Prophet left, so he left Musa, it's kind of like, leave me alone, I'm going back. And then he said, and this hadith is in Al-Bukhari, 
And then Prophet Muhammad said, I heard a voice saying, La ilaha illallah. He heard a voice saying, what's this voice saying? I have passed my order and have lessened the burden of my worshippers. This is Allah's voice. This is Allah's voice. So Allah is saying here that I have passed my order and have lessened the burden of my worshippers. He talks like humans. <laughs> and who's, this is incredible, my sisters. The, the next hadith will give us more into this, more insight in this. But anyhow, this hadith is still taken from Anas ibn Malik, the little kid. But this time they say it comes from another man who heard it from Anas ibn Malik, Abu Dhar al-Ghifari. Again, the hadith goes like this. This is another hadith that I'm going to mention to you. While I was in Mecca, the roof of my house was opened. And the Jibreel descended, opened my chest, and washed it with Zamzam water. This is a different event from when he was six years old. So this is the second time. I don't know what happened in the first one, but anyhow. Then he, i.e. Jibreel, brought a golden tray. The, the craziness about gold, it's almost like gold is the highest metal. Genesis is complete. how Jibreel comes down with gold. And it was filled with hikmah, wisdom, and faith, belief. A prophet for all these years, but, but you know. And having poured its content into my chest, then closed it. So I wanted to imagine this. A golden tray full of wisdom and ima. Wisdom and faith, you cannot touch them. They, they cannot be touched. It's not like uh, Coca-Cola and Pepsi. Uh, wisdom and faith, they cannot be touched. But still, they are contained in a golden tray and they are poured in the chest of the messenger. But anyhow, keep this in mind because uh, this took place after so many long, grueling years when the Prophet had suffered with the Kuffar, but still, you know. but anyhow, Jibril took my hand and ascended with me to the nearest heaven. This one here, he didn't go to Jerusalem, it's straight from Mecca to heaven. Then, when I reached the nearest heaven, Jibril said to the keepers of the heaven, open up the gate. The gatekeeper goes, who is it? Jibril. The gatekeeper asks, is anyone with you? Jibril replied, yes, Muhammad is with me. He asked, has he been called? Jibril said, yes. Not why is he here? No, no, has he been called? How does this angel know if Muhammad has he been called? Did he receive like a daily memo of his duties? Or Muhammad's going to be called? I don't know how, but anyhow. Uh, of course, to me, all this means zero. I don't believe any of this. But, you know, it's there, so I have to bring it to your attention. So the gate was opened, and we went over the nearest heaven. This is the first heaven. And there we saw a man sitting with some people on his right and some on his left. Pay attention. When he looked towards his right, he would laugh. And when he looked towards his left, he would weep. And then he said, Welcome, O pious prophet and pious son. I asked Jibril, who is he? Jibril replied, Oh, this is Adam. See how the, the, this narration is different to the other one? Because people had taken all that kind of stuff. Now it's starting to become like a Hollywood movie. It has more elements into it. Now we have Adam, who looks right, laughs, looks left, cries. Jibril is going to answer why he does that. So he tells him, Adam and the people on his right and left are the souls of his offspring, meaning you and I, we are alive, but our souls are with Adam to the right and to the left. Those on his right are the people of paradise, and those on his left are the people of hellfire. And when he looks towards his right, he laughs because he's happy for them. And when he looks towards his left, he weeps. Our faith is sealed, my sisters and my brothers. We don't know. According to this nonsense, of course, all this is a lie. Adam is dead, 
The, the earth has eaten his body, the physical body. His soul, like any other soul, is uh, in a world beyond the barzakh, be, be, behind an obstacle that stops the souls from coming back to earth. And they are there sleeping until judgment day. This is what the Quran says. All this is nonsense. There is no Musa alive. Nobody is alive after they die. It. Once they die, they die. There is no life after death. And I say my, for this particular, this is an absolute lie. Because this makes the whole purpose of Allah's religion and Islam a total joke. If Adam has already got the quota who's going to go to hellfire and who's going to go to paradise and our fate and ends have already been sealed, no matter what we do, we'll end up where it's already been decided for us. So who in their right mind would say or believe in such injustice? How can, I, how can I believe in this? With such injustice, anyone can win the argument against Allah on Judgment Day. I'm going to go to Pharaoh. Okay? Allah is going to say, take Pharaoh to hellfire for eternity. Pharaoh says, why? Allah says, you disbelieve it. And Pharaoh goes, no. You decided my fate before you even created me. You created me based on what you knew. You never gave me an opportunity, a free opportunity to do, to work for me. And had you done that, I would have been a better person. I'm sorry, I don't accept your ruling. And there is no way that Allah can win the argument. There is no way. And it is incredible that this hadith even exists. What the Quran and says the opposite all the way. And this is why the Quran has no place in our current Islam because Al Quran and Al Hadith cannot be in the same place. At the same place. Al Islam of the Quran cannot be Al Islam of the Hadith. They can't. They cannot. They cannot. They cannot. Allah will say to those on Judgment Day who will lament and deeply regret, beat themselves to death, cry and they regret and all that kind of stuff. He will tell them, these people will ask why we are here and Ya Allah, the angels will answer them. They will tell them, You are in such state headed towards hellfire. That is because of what your hands have forwarded today. Because the action you did today, we forward them to judgment day where we will be accountable for them. And then the angels add, Wa anna Allah, And for sure Allah, Allah is not a tyrant. He does not wrong any of his subservience. And this is in Surah 8, Ayah 51. So Allah doesn't wrong us and he is not tyrant to us. And yet this hadith says that our fate is sealed and end of it. Let's move on to the second heaven. Jibreel ascends with him till they reach the second heaven. And again, said to the gate uh, keepers, open the gate, the same scenario. But here, Abu Dhar added that the prophet Adam, Idris, Musa, Jesus, and Abraham, okay, were from the first to the sixth heaven. But he didn't mention in which heavens they were. He just, they say, they were there. But anyhow, Anas now adds, when Jibreel, along with the prophet, passed by Idris, Idris said, be welcomed, my good brother, and pious prophet. Again, same thing, the prophet will ask, who is this? This is Idris, Musa, Jesus, and all that. And my sisters and my brothers, I will say this, it's very strange that these people, the prophets that are in heavens, would recognize who the prophet Muhammad is. They will answer back his salam. Yet, he doesn't know who they are, and he keeps asking Jibril about their identities. After having spoken to them, they didn't even introduce themselves to him. And that's very rude, plain rude, and just does not make sense. What's even more stranger is the keepers of the gate themselves have no clue who Jibril's companion is. But all the prophets in the heavens, guess what? All of them recognize the Prophet Muhammad. Isn't this very peculiar? Abdullah ibn Abbas and, Abd, uh, and Abu Hassan al-Ansari or Abu Habba al-Ansari used to tell people that the Prophet added that Jibreel ascended with me to a place where I heard the squeaking sound of pins which write humans' actions. And I say this is impossible 
because the book of actions al-imam al-mubin that Allah speaks about in the Quran is with Allah and Allah alone it is impossible for any human to get any closer to it much less to hear the angels write the human's actions in it it's just impossible also why would angels use feathers and ink to write down human's action haven't they heard of computers haven't they heard of artificial intelligence have they heard of pens why are they so backward because those who invented this hadith in their time writing with feather and ink was the norm and the squeaking sound that the the feather makes on a dry paper is that's what's there that's why they told it to us in the hadith like if they had computers it would have computers on iMac that's how it would have been but a lie is a lie again let's go to the prescription of a salat and the haggling with Allah over the quantity Anas ibn Malik further said, the Prophet said that Allah prescribed 50 salat on my followers. When I returned with this order, I passed by Musa. So Ibrahim didn't say anything, he passed by Musa. Musa asked, what has Allah prescribed on your nation? Again, how did he know? Why should he care? I replied, 50 salat. Musa says, go back to your Lord and appeal for redaction. Your nations will not be able to bury them. Then he told him about how the children of Israel were difficult and things like that. The Prophet says, so I went back to Allah and requested for redaction. And he reduced it to half. Now this hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim. Go straight away reduced it to half. Not 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 50, go straight away to 25. When I passed by Musa again and informed him about it, said, he goes, go back to your Lord and ask uh, him to reduce because your followers will not be able to bear it. So I returned and requested of Allah further reductions. And then guess what? Allah reduced. And the, the same scene keeps going, coming, going, going until they reach the, uh, the, the number of five. And then, as the Prophet was going, he again heard the voice. But now this voice is more detailed, not as generic, generic as it was before. The voice said, these are five prayers, and they are all equal to 50 in rewards. For my words, i.e. Allah's word, does not change. My question is, from 50 to 5, after all these reductions, and he tells me his word doesn't change? But what just had happened from 50 to 5? Isn't that a word change? But you know. And then the messenger said, I returned to Musa and he told me to go back again. I replied, now I feel shy of asking my Lord again. Then Jibril took me till we reached Sidratul Munta. Again, the lot tree or the lot tree of the final boundary. And they say it's got some beautiful colors that the messenger of Allah could not describe. They were undescribable. But anyhow, and then the messenger says, then I was admitted into Jannah, where I found small tents or walls made of pearls and its earth was of musk. And of course, this is a lie. Jannah is not created as yet. There is no way for him to enter it, just like there is no way of him to enter paradise. Because the hadiths in Bukhari, Muslim, and all these things, they tell us that when he was there, he entered Jannah, he even entered hellfire. Enter hellfire. If, if a human being, if you were taken into a room and made to watch a, a, a scene, a, a torture scene of some kind, and the brutal one, would you be able to look at it and I, I, I live all my life completely traumatized. But the messenger walking to hellfire, but still is okay. He sees people murdered, tortured, and things like that. And he's cool with that, and then he comes back normal. I lose my mind. I will speak later on about other elements in the Quran and the Prophet and because you need to understand that Allah did not make the Prophet Muhammad a superhuman so that he enter into hellfire and is not affected or he goes into Jannah and is not affected by the sheer beauty of it. Okay, because at the end of it the Prophet Muhammad never entered Jannah and never entered hellfire just because they have not been created as yet. More on this later on. So as you can see in this installment here, that the issue of Al-Isra al-Mi'raj and the 50 prayers of the Shada has got more holes in it than a fruit dryer in your kitchen.
Okay, so it's impossible for such an act to have taken place. Our sheikhs today are the most. What what is the best description that I can use against them without being rude? Because they are the most deceptive. They are the most crooks. They are the most con men out there working uh, with Allah's religion to make a living. Yes, they study in Islamic university, then they go teach, then they become an imam and make money out of becoming an imam. And once the government starts paying them, they cannot say the truth because now their daily bread depends on what they, their mouths say. And they are okay preaching anything as long as it helps them keep the monthly check in coming in. Al-Isra and Al-Mi'raj, as you will see, inshallah, later on as we progress with this, never took place. Never, 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 never. And that the Prophet Muhammad is a human just like you and me. What's good for you is good for me. I want to see somebody go on a plane, 747. We kind of like get a nice chair on top of the plane and ensure that the chair is very tightly and securely secured to the plane. We bring this person and we have them sit in the chair and we secure them so that nothing happens to them. And I want to see a plane flying at speed of 500 miles an hour. 500 miles an hour. And see how much is left of that human being once the plane lands. You're going to see that the person will die instantly. Driving your car at 100 kilometers or 60, 70 miles an hour on a windy day. Stick your arm out of the window and watch the resistance of the air against your hand. And this is you driving in a car. Imagine being on a mule or donkey or in between where the animal is faster than the speed of light. You're not going to be able to live and neither will the messenger of Allah. Because the Quran has stated that the messenger of Allah is a human being just like you and me. Nothing is different than you and me. He gets hungry, he gets thirsty, uh, thirsty, he gets sick, he gets tired, he gets lazy. Everything that happens to you gets to me. He gets sexually aroused, he is sexually aroused. He goes to the bathroom, he goes to the toilet. Everything just like you. Nothing, nothing, nothing makes him uh, one of the Avengers uh, in the movies, superhero, uh, things like that. I pray to Allah that this installment will help you see more clearer into this, uh, how do I put it, the tale, this fantasy tale, the Harry Potter's like tale of a some mystique journey in the paranormal world where it's, it's, it's beyond normal. In the next ones, inshallah, we will carry on with the other evidences to speak about Al-Isra and Al-Mi'raj and the impact of this of this lie on the Salat. So people today, they believe that the Salat was given to the messenger in this night, and they completely ignore that a Salat was given in Al-Quran before this night, years before that. But people don't want to listen to the Quran today, and if you tell them the Quran says, they straight away attack you and make you the enemy of Islam. One of my, probably almost like a title, like I want to destroy Islam, I want to destroy Sunnah. And I told to somebody, if what you say is destroyable, then it should be destroyed. If it's not destroyable, then why are you bringing it in? But the Quran, nobody says you want to destroy the Quran, because the Quran cannot be destroyed. But anyhow, I'll end here because I'm coming to the end of the hour. And I pray to Allah to open our hearts to the truth that is in the Quran. One last point, my dear sisters and my brothers. Yes, I, I bring informations to you and I tell them to you and things like that. But what's dear to my heart is you learn the thinking process that I bring in. I, again, you learn the thinking process, the criticism that I bring in. So when Musa interferes, when Allah says 50, yes, uh, Musa should never have opened his mouth. But also you learn that how come Musa 
is more better, more compassionate than Allah. And then from there you go, that's impossible. And since it's impossible, this event is impossible. You learn the thinking process. And uh, after part three, inshallah, I need to prepare it. And uh, once I give you a couple more days to listen to this, and then I will upload the part three of the third installment of if Al-Quran by itself is the only authority in Islam, then how did we learn to pray? And when I finish this series, inshallah, you will understand that the Quran didn't leave anything untouched, no stones unturned, and everything is explained in Al-Quran. This is again your brother, Abdul Salam Abu Hanifa, and I pray to Allah to bless you. And you have a wonderful time until I speak to you next. Again, this talk can be found on YouTube at Islam Pep Talk. And if you want to join my uh, internet, my WhatsApp group, then just email me and they will take it from there. I'll be more than happy to add you in. Again, Assalamu Alaikum Warahmatullahi Wabarakatuh.